So uh, this, this is about the origins of the virus, not the epidemic. Obviously, the epidemic is an epidemic of HIV, but there wasn't always HIV. HIV is a new virus, 100 years, let's say, pretty much in the form it's in now. And um, the, the thing is that uh, in our work over the years, now my, my, co my co-authors are Preston Marx, who's a leading simian virologist in the country. He's the editor of the journal, the author of the textbook, and the head of the Primate Center, the infectious, the, the immunology part of the Primate Center in New Orleans at Tulane, where our grant is based. We're in, it's an NIH-funded project, now operating in Brazzaville in the Congo. And Bill Schneider is, uh, uh, we've been working at this for 15 years, Bill five years only, but Preston and I, who met it on an airplane, um, uh, were uh, looking at the origin of AIDS. Why AIDS at this time? Because the monkey viruses that this comes from are very old, hundreds of thousands of year old. The, in this case, chimpanzees, an ape, not a monkey. But you notice the HIVs, there's more than one HIV. I don't mean type M, type O, I mean HIV-1 and HIV-2. And those are different viruses that come from a different simian species. And it's very important to the argument, we'll cut to that. Um, there's a, we had a conference in Paris in, uh, in 2010 about the, the larger issue of simian viruses, emerging diseases. Emerging viral diseases is the rubric under which this goes in public health and, and epidemiology. And the, um, this website, uh, I can, we can send it out to you if you want, you can find it easily enough, has that conference, a three-day conference, and it's a beautiful job they did with um, uh, f uh, films of the speakers in one box and the PowerPoints in another box, and it's really well produced. Uh, the French do a nice job on this at the Sorbonne. Uh, and um, you can see the entire conference. And any of you are interested in emerging viral diseases, some of the best people in the world are there. I, I snuck in and uh, helped organize. So let me go to the point. Uh, it's a tale about Africa. And you know that the notion that AIDS came out of Africa, which is true, uh, first cases uh, moved out into the wider world from Africa, where they, were, uh, where, where they emerged. Uh, and um, in fact, HIV-1, the HIV-1 epidemic, pretty much as far as we can tell, traces back uh, to Kinshasa in the 1950s, in, the, in Zaire at the time, the Congo now. Um, and that's uh, Central Africa, Zaire when this map was made. And we work in the Republic of Congo, right across from Kinshasa, in a place called Brazzaville, which, the, which was the French Equatorial Africa, whereas the Congo, Zaire, was Belgian property. Um, and uh, here's, here's the research question that drives this, the problem. That there are, in fact, two separate HIV epidemics, HIV-1 and 2. They emerge at about the same time. Uh, and the oldest known case, example of a virus that was frozen away from a hepatitis study uh, um, was from 1959. So we know the virus exists in its human form by 59. So that, that's, a, that's a point to remember in this, because something happens before 1959 to create that virus. Did it happen 5,000 years ago? Did it happen over 100 years? Did it ha you know, when? And the importance of that is that emerging viruses, uh, leaving an animal reservoir and moving to, a, to humans, is something that's happening all the time. Uh, hepatitis was not in the human population 300 years ago. And now it's more prevalent by a factor of 10 than HIV is in the human population. Fortunately, it's not as lethal as quickly, but it's a very serious issue. So the, the problem, two, two fully adapted to epidemic strains. So I've been, become a student of, epidemic, of, 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 of evolutionary virology. And the thing is, fully adapted viruses means, in, in, to the virologists who study this, means that they can reproduce through um, a human to human transmission sexual transmission, airborne transmission. The, 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 recent, the recent scare, well, you see the movie Contagion, which I think is a very good job of this, actually. Uh, and I, I, actually, Ian, uh, Ian is a, uh, what's Ian's last name? Ah. Lipkin, Ian Lipkin at Columbia is our, is, works with us on this, on this research looking for uh, new strains of viruses. But the, the idea that viruses move from one species to another, that you know, the famous kind of cooking pot of this in parts of Asia, where different animal species are kept in, in cages above each other and they mix up what they, the viruses from their droppings and their urine. And it's just a constant process of, of pushing out new viruses which challenge 
themselves against you, any species that's around that handles them. So the people who handled these viruses got bird flu and got SARS, but they mostly didn't transmit to other people. And that's why this recent scare about a new uh, engineered form of bird virus that, that could break through to become an airborne or a droplet-borne or a touch-borne virus. So the fact that the two viruses, the two HIV-1 and 2, which I, before I got into this 15 years ago, believed one had come from the other. I assumed two came after one, so two came from one. It's not true. They came from a different place. They came from a different species. And we can trace the lineage of viruses very, very well now and see where they came from. And not only well, but how long they came from here to there because the number of mutations, in a way, put what's called a molecular clock on the process. Those tree diagrams you see are also time diagrams. And finally, the human exposure to these has been forever. Uh, people always hunted and butchered and got bit by and got blood exposure from the animals that they hunted. And these animals, in the case of HIV-1 chimpanzees in Central Africa, um, uh, there's, there's pictures that got deleted from, oh no, they're here, okay, there's bushmeat. Uh, that's what it was about. It was about uh, getting, it was like people in the south hunting squirrels and deer, just no difference at all. Uh, this is a mandrel, endangered species, and here's the process we're talking about. Okay, ugly but real and part of life, and if you go to an abattoir anywhere in the world, people get blood in their hands. So the exposure, you know, was going on forever. So what happened? Uh, and we know from the, vir from the molecular examination of the DNA of the simian viruses that 75% of simian species carry a, 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 a prototype of a, of, a, of a retrovirus that's, that forms the basis of, of evolving into HIVs in various ways, that, that those viruses are hundreds of thousands of years old. And people have hunted and butchered those animals for that period of time. So why suddenly, in the, in the mid 20th century, do we see the emergence, not just of an epidemic, but of new, vi but, but of new viruses. Not, they, 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 that crossover wasn't like rabies, exp like exposing a person to rabies where they catch the thing from the animal or this, or this uh, engineered form of bird flu. This virus had to transform itself. The number uh, of, of DNA changes from it to the human virus is, is substantial. It doesn't just happen from a, 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 version, a particular case of the virus in a monkey that happens to be close enough that it can skip over to a human and become, um, and become epidemic in humans where it has to replicate in the human with sufficient vigor uh, and sufficiently productive to shed off viral material in the envelope that, that's used in sexual transmission. That's what's being transmitted as pieces of the virus uh, sufficient to, uh, to infect, to establish an infection. Even today, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, in, in a single dose of infective material, let's say semen or, 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 or uh, blood from a human being to another, fewer than 3% of the viruses that establish an infection are actually capable of establishing an infection. Because the thing is mutating very rapidly and most of the products are defective. And it's the rare proportion of those, and that's one of the reasons why the sexual transmission rate is so low. The, the discordant couples where someone should be, should be infected, how come they're not? Uh, well, because the chance, of, it's, a, it's a Russian roulette where there's a thousand, bar, a thousand rooms for a thousand bullets and only two or three of them have bullets in them. Anyway, I want to go through the story. So that was our, that's, that's what's driving this, that something must have happened. Something must have happened in Africa in the period uh, prior to 1959. We can't say how far prior because we, we don't have samples from an earlier period from that. But that's where the history comes in. The third author on this is Bill Schneider, who's the uh, head of the history department at the University of Indiana, Indiana in Indianapolis and the world's expert on the history of blood. Uh, and I was directed to him from, uh, from Patrick Eberhardt, our friends who have met Saint Dumont in France, who'd worked in Africa. He's an old, he was a fellow who'd worked in Africa as well. And we put together an interdisciplinary, that was my point of mentioning it, a truly interdisciplinary team, because I came to this knowing no virology, but epidemiology, and Bill came into it knowing neither epidemiology, but knowing the history. And in fact, it's a tale of epidemiological, evolutionary uh, virology history. That's what the story is, okay? So, this, we lost uh, this slide. 
Uh, we, I have to thank Leif. We, we, I, had, I came with, my, with a Mac formatted uh, presentation, but I couldn't bring my computer because it busted. And we went through tricks to get them. We lost a few of the pictures. But, so we have a theory. It's called the serial human passage of SIV beyond sterile injecting enabled the emergence of epidemic AIDS. Now, any of you who have worked in Africa, as Jerry did in the Peace Corps, and any of you who have traveled and worked in clinics in Africa, know the prominence of injections in daily life. One study, a remarkable study from Uganda from 63, showed that something like 65 or 75 percent of the households had a needle in the house uh, because they had animals and they gave injections to animals. But they also, people would routinely take injections themselves, vitamin B on a Friday night to, uh, you know, to wake you up. Um, penicillin was sold. I'll show you the pictures. Uh, oh, I should go for the theory first. So the theory is that um, by moving a virus, from one, a wild virus, from one person to another, there's a window uh, in which that virus survives in people uh, before the immune system beats it back. It's not a pathogen for humans. It, it can't, the, the simian virus itself cannot establish an infection in humans, multiply sufficiently to be reproducible from one person to another. And what happens though is that as it tries to do that over, let's say, a t eight to 12 week period, the virus adapts slightly. It, it's, 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 it's the mutations that are more successful at surviving in the environment of the new human host prevail, and you begin to get a, a maturation of that virus in the direction of an adapted virus to humans. But then the immune system wipes it out, and it's gone. But if before, in that window period, you would take a blood sample from that person, share a needle, get a blood transfusion to another person, you, you infect them with the virus, as you do with all the viruses that would be in their blood, but you also um, give it another lease on life. And this one's a bit longer because it's now, let's say, able to live three or four months instead of one or two months. And it can adapt further. And the numbers of the mutational change necessary to get from here to there, from the, from the simian virus to the human virus, is about four or five of those passages we calculate. Okay? And that's not a lot. Uh, but in, na in nature, it would never happen. I mean, where, where, where were the opportunities for blood-borne passage of a virus before the introduction of medical procedures, on a massive basis, before the introduction of, me of, of, of medical procedures that involve blood? There was not a routine thing of, of blood moving from person to person. Uh, there are animals that have blood-borne diseases that move because they fight over food and they get blood from the, 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 the poor Tasmanian tigers in Australia are being decimated by a virus that spreads because they fight over the food and they get blood similar to what happens with smoking crack from a, from a broken glass pipe where you get cuts. You, you, you open up a channel for blood-borne viruses to move. And that's what happened with the introduction, the theory goes, with the introduction of needles and transfusions, in, needles first, into Africa. And that happened um, in the 20th century. There were very crude injection equipments avail uh, forms of injection equipment available before that, but nothing like the scale of what began to happen, uh, especially in Africa in the period of the, in the 20th century and especially the second half of the 20th century. So the way the theory goes is with um, do, 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 with uh, uh, the first passage, you have a, a low. This is the SIV plasma virus load, how much of the virus is, uh, is, is, is surviving in the human to leave, a, to leave a fingerprint behind. And the idea is that the first, the first passage of it in the first person gets this high uh, a level, and the second one gets that high, and the third gets the idea that you're amplifying uh, the virus in a way that makes it, um, you're, you're really selecting for transmissibility is what you're doing. Uh, but in terms of the viral load that that, that virus can achieve, how long, which is a measure of its time of survival in the human, is going up. So that's, that's the concept behind it. It's kind of the opposite of how vaccines are made where you attenuate viruses. Uh, because this is natural selection, because in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in virus creation, you control that in a laboratory. You know which direction the, the pathogenicity of the virus is going. You test it each time, and you select for the ones that don't transmit well. Um, and, uh, but in this case, you, you, you're, you're selecting both for pathogenicity, ability to survive in a human host, and with that, transmissibility. In fact, the, the thinking in the field of evolutionary virology now is that the transmissibility is the principal thing that you're selecting for. From, and certainly from an epidemiologist's point of view, 
It's music to my ears, because that's, that's what we understand about in epidemiology. That's what distinguishes epidemiology from other uh, parts of biological science. You're concerned not with, the, with the, 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 the pathophysiology of the disease, but its transmissibility. So, um, unsterile medical injections. Now, now, people have been getting injections with very crude devices for hundreds of years. You know, the king's dying and they drag in a young boy and they take some blood from him with this, with this horrible old thing and they pump it into the king and they both die, you know, because they didn't know about blood typing. Uh, blood typing is invented. <coughs> Blood typing is invented in 1910-11. The publications, the principal publications of blood typing are early 20th century. How new these things are. And the production of what we think of as a modern syringe is late 1900s. And I try to learn this history, um, and there's a paper about it, the first one we published in 01, uh, called the injection century, because as I began to look at I was trying to understand about needles and how they would transmit, because I'd worked with drug addicts in the Bronx long enough that I understood something about the transmission possibilities, because it wasn't just HIV that was being transmitted by, uh, by needles. The earliest studies you see of needle-borne transmission of, of diseases are from the 1930s when they found people with malaria in Minnesota. Never, a mosquito never could survive in Minnesota in the cold winter. And yet there were cases because, in fact, it was a blood, a blood transmissible infection, uh, in that case, a parasitic infection. But what's in human blood, as soon as you open up that bandwidth to allow things to move between people by, blood, by, by the blood route, and my, 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 my assertion would be that that's a new phenomenon in human history, that I can't think of any other condition which would have massive uh, opportunities for for transmission of bloodborne uh, pathogens, other than the, 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 the development of, and, and installation of injections and trans later transfusions into Africa. They happen at the same time, actually. So uh, here's the story in one, in one graph. And uh, just note this is, a log, this is a log scale for the global production of units per year of needles and syringes. And this is the red curve, right, uh, going up uh, from 1900 is still true, uh, going up to by what, 11 orders of magnitude in the course of 100 years. And this dotted line is the oldest known strain of HIV from Zaire, Congo, of 1959, uh, called Z59. And you notice the inflection points very close to that in time. Because we know that by 59, the job has been done. The, the, the virus, the, the human virus, fully adapted, transmissible, has been created. It's already spreading as an epidemic invisibly. Invisible. It's very unlikely that the first virus that the sample discovered was the first one that existed. But you've had a process underway there, uh, especially in this period just after World War II, because th this is where the interdisciplinary part comes in. You know, what happened after World War II was that medicine and the installation of Western medicine in Africa and the colonial, as the colonial era was ending, those who don't know, the colonial era ends with a clunk in 1960. 90% between 1960 and 62, 95% of the colonies in, in Africa get their independence one way or another from Britain, from France, from Spain, from Portugal. Germany's had been taken away in World War I. And th this correspondence of the of number of needles being produced in the world is, is paralleled by a drop in their, uh, va in their price. So it become much more numerous, going from tens of thousands produced in factories back at this point, hand produced in factories, tens of thousands, to uh, billions produced today by machine means. And, and at this point also is the transition from metals, metal re reusable syringes to plastic disposable syringes, single use syringes supposedly. Now of course, in, in the conditions of poverty in, in much of Africa, they never had they, they don't throw away anything, and they didn't throw away these needles. They got reused just like the drug users did. Again, the story was exactly the same story, is that because, in this case, uh, the, the economy that didn't allow you to buy new syringes for the clinics that you worked in in Africa, or the, uh, in the case of the drug users in the Bronx, the, the, the dangers associated with having a syringe for getting arrested for the equipment, uh, that all pushed in the direction of needle sharing. Uh, and and the, 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 one of the wisest things I've had, and I think it comes out of Dr. Heimer's work here, was the idea that, that, that needles share people. People don't share needles. Because the trick to this is keeping your eye on the vector 
and on the virus. Think like a virus. Think like the vector. What is it that, what, what is it that tr allows that transit? So the fact that people come to the needle is ex completely explicit in a clinic I w I'll show you a picture of uh, up the road uh, where, where people would come and get injected with a syringe that wasn't clean, which is exactly the story of the shooting gallery. Right? We have pictures of that as well. So the, the, the drop in, the, the, whoops, the increase in production, whoops, 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 the increase in production, the drop in price, uh, they converge on the, on the period where AIDS emerged. So, you know, if it has long ears and a fuzzy tail and it hops, maybe it's a bunny. Uh, and uh, um, begin to take this theory seriously at this point. Uh, so this is my contribution to the, to the science of it. Um, we began to work in the, in the field in, in, in Kumba and Cameroon. We had a field station, we collected samples going back into the 60s uh, and uh, the, um, looked at the availability of, of injectable stuff in the markets and found it was very easy to buy. This is the this is the local drugstore in this town, and uh, there's penicillin on that shelf, and you can buy needles there, and you can buy them in the market that convenes every Friday uh, in the market with, with, with and you, you could buy third generation cephalosporins, uh, and, uh, uh, drugs for infectious diseases and infections that you couldn't get in Yale Hospital without a infectious disease consult because people were concerned, even this is 15 years ago when people were already concerned about antibiotic resistance. And you have, you have these drugs flooding into these markets, manufactured in India, manufactured in Russia, coming down the road from Nigeria, and they're in these shops and everybody gets injections all the time. Then, um, and then these pictures going back to the, this goes back to the 20s in Leopoldville, in, in, which was the uh, Belgian Congo, uh, smallpox inoculations. Not that there were no injections taking place in Africa before the emergence of AIDS in the 50s, but the order of magnitude was dramatically different. So here's the old the evidence, uh, uh, the, the pictures of that campaign, the levels of smallpox vaccinations, and this is real historical data. Um, and you see it wherever you look, trypanosomas uh, campaigns, um, smallpox, campaigns. This, is, uh, this is running up through the 50s, uh, where smallpox campaigns in West Africa. Uh, but you see uh, the numbers are tens of thousands of injections in the campaigns. And what happens dramatically is, let me take you there, uh, the U.S. campaigns, okay, these are the important ones, because you note the date on this, uh, is 1957. And these are the first campaigns of the, of, of the WHO and, and they're using UNESCO, UNICEF, which is, you, yeah, I always confuse UNESCO, and one, one of them administers child health program, which is the cultural one. UNESCO is cultural. UNESCO, not UNESCO, UNICEF. Administered these programs before, w, before the WHO was really up on its feet running them. And, uh, and these are the, um, uh, the, the, the U.S. eradication campaign, which was the first large-scale use of penicillin. Massive campaigns in Central Africa, Haiti, and India in the 50s, uh, going in and giving single shots of penicillin. All, all, all penicillin then was injectable. Uh, it was very expensive still, although the expansion of production had happened in the late 40s uh, into a lot of countries in the world. Um, something like 75 or 80 percent of the entire pharmaceutical industry of the United States between 1946 and 1952 uh, was occupied with producing antibiotics, penicillin, uh, tetracycline, which is tubercul tetracycline for tuberculosis. How new these drugs were! Some, you know, some, some, you know we were we were in junior high school when these drugs were actually first available because before that people died of infections in very large numbers. And it set the, it set the stage for, for magical expectations about what drugs could do because they were true of, of, uh, of infectious diseases while the antibiotics still had their efficacy without our understanding that, they, that, they, that we had an actual adversary in the viruses and the bacteria that we, you know, we were treating. We weren't treating viruses with antibiotics. They would come later. But that the, these, these are organisms that are always evolving in the face of the challenges, like the cockroaches you know, get resistant to the cockroach killers. It's, that, it's a banal story, but it's, it's a baseline reality of biology. So um, the numbers examined and treated just jump in order of magnitude. You see these large numbers of people uh, in, in, in 1957 getting injections. So in the period, in Central Africa alone, in the period from 1955 
1952 actually to 1962, that 10 years, about 35 million injections occurred uh, in these U.S. eradicated, and they eradicated, the U.S. is a very nasty form of treponemal disease related to, uh, uh, to, to syphilis. It manifests itself in the skin. It, children get it from contact to the skin. It hurts like hell, and it, not, and it really uh, diminishes the workforce. And that's why they were so motivated, even in colonial Africa, because 57 means colonialism wasn't done yet. Uh, and these were the first massive, and they were being paid for by the United Nations, which the colonial powers loved. And injections, injections, injections. Uh, and pr previous to this, the treatments were, uh, were arsenicals, these very painful drugs based in toxins, uh, the old approaches to killing parasites before the uh, newer techniques were developed. So these were, uh, is this the Egyptian? No, this is from, uh, this is Cameron studies. But the, the, the hepatitis C, I think this one was about that, hepatitis C uh, grew out of, of, of a campaign in Egypt in the 1950s using a series of injections where uh, you move into a village and, 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 and treat a lot of people and they had to come back for another shot uh, four days later and another one, five, is that kind of timing about right? Day? Yeah, for, for the, for the uh, schistosomiasis programs. The, but you, the, the idea was that you'd move into a village and you'd get the whole series of injections, like take the whole dose series of, of antibiotics for the, for the course of, um, of a week or so, or of a month rather. And um, a perfect mechanism given the latent infections of hepatitis C that were somewhere dormant in that community and have it emerge such that those communities that got the program have 10% prevalence figures today of hepatitis C. Uh, if you go outside of the drug using population in the United States, the prevalence is 0 .001, something like that, of hep C. Because it's principally, it's some sexual transmission, but not significant, it's a blood-borne disease. And the disease was, was let loose by these campaigns. Okay, blood transfusions. Um, so with, with Bill, we began to look at the role of blood transfusions, which I, I felt very stupid, but I, we'd gone to look at injections, and we were making logs of the number of injections. I was interviewing African patients in New York about injections they'd had back in Africa. But in this little village in Cameroon, there was guys coming down and getting transfusions from the local health stations, from the various practitioners, from the different hospitals, maybe 50 or 60 transfusions uh, a year in an in a, in a, in a area which had about 50,000 people. And I knew it was just the tip of an iceberg because many people went down to, uh, to, to Yaoundé or I forgot the other city in Cameroon where the hospitals were to get transfusions, but often they were emergency cases for malaria commonly, uh, pregnancy, accidents. Um, so transfusions grow a pace of the injections. Uh, and of course, transfusions, unlike injections, are a totally efficient way of transmitting a viral infection, you know, in the high 90s of, of, of effect, you know, effective transmission. Uh, and here's the years of the first reports of blood transfusions in, uh, it, throughout um, sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, you see that they, they really jump up. There are a few earlier examples. They were experimenting with transfusions. They had blood typing, but there weren't blood banks then. No one knew how to preserve blood adequately. Uh, and, uh, but, by the, but by the 50s, there were. And you begin to see the, the development of, uh, of, the, um, of, of transfusion campaigns in large numbers. It became a, a criteria of the development of the, of the healthcare system. And uh, more of that. Uh, the reason, the, the, and, and here's, here's the transmission rates for the different ways of transmitting HIV, HIV now, and you can see that they're not terribly efficient, but blood transfusion, the point to this in this paper was that the high efficiency of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of transfusions with uh, mother-to-child transmission being uh, overestimated here at the time we took it. it was, even before any intervention, it was in the 20s really, wasn't it? Uh, these are old slides, sorry. Uh, so I don't want to, this is the growth of transfusion uh, in, in Africa, going up to uh, um, um, hundreds of thousands of, of transfusions taking place in countries in this period of 60s. A uh, very interesting thing from a methodological point of view is that as we, we pulled all the data we could find from historical archives about transfusion, all the papers published, that on the upswing of this in the, in the 50s, as hospitals were establishing the use of transfusions, they published papers to establish their bona fides and, and take pride in what they were doing and say we're a modern hospital center. And then the papers drop off the, off the cliff. 
because it was ho-hum by then. It was every day. It became a routine part of medical practice. You, you know, I defy you to find out how many uh, transfusions are done in the United States today. They don't measure transfusions. They measure uh, donations. The market, the, the blood market is about donations, not transfusions, because you know, there's a lot of, there's lost blood for poor storage. Uh, it's a very, for those who are interested in, in history and public health, it's a, it's a very interesting topic with much work to do. So um, the, the time period of the, uh, of the, um, of the in, in, in which the transfusions peak uh, in, in these countries all hover around the same time, the period before the 50s, where you see these inflections, this, 19, this 1964 actually. Uh, but through the late 50s and early 60s, you see a dramatic increase in the number of, uh, of transfusions taking place. So this is driving what now is becoming not just a channel that helped create the AIDS virus, but a channel to perpetuate it, which is also true of the injections. And I don't want to confuse, so these are all of them combined, and, 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 and they, they focus right, they, they have fall right on 1950, 58, 59. Um, one of the confusions in this work is between the epidemic of HIV and the creation of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the virus. And it's, it's easy to confound the two because they're running in parallel. There are other changes happening in Africa in this time. Urbanization, development of roads, population growth, sexual habits changing. Modernity is entering Africa in the period after colonialism. So you never have the pure experiment. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's very, very challenging, uh, a kind of epidemiological task to actually get a uh, a persuasive argument that there was something unique about the um, about the role of injections and transfusions, which our group holds to, but there are other groups, the books published recently, saying it was the trade routes, it was the increased movement of people, the virus was gradually somehow becoming more capable uh, without specifying what would enable that to happen, but look, more of it was transmitting, although the, 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 the molecular clocks and the guys who work on that very, very precise. Where they, they, yes, the virus was there in 1898, uh, but it was a different virus. And you can see from the lineage of the ones that exist now how many degrees of molecular difference, DNA difference, there were between the new ones and the old ones. But clearly what happens in the 50s is the virus becomes epidemically capable in a way that it wasn't before, or you would have had the epidemic. Because all the drivers, the infections, the exposures of human beings to the simian viruses, the infections of human beings by the simian viruses, the short-lasting nature, those are biological facts. They don't change by, over time because people are traveling around more. But the virus itself, the endpoint, the, the adapted virus that can be transmitted sexually, the principal means of transmission of HIV in the world, uh, uh, are, are, being, are being cooked by this process of moving it from person to person. So our, our research, in, and I'm going to stop here because we have, we have time for some questions and discussion. Um, the, the, the injections are still a major source of, trans, of, of transmission in, in, of HIV in every country that has a high prevalence, background prevalence for that. We're, in, in Western developed countries, it's the um, it's, the, it's HIV uh, transmitted by sharing needles. In less developed countries, although they're now developing serious problems with injecting drug use in many South, Southern African countries, uh, but the, 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 wide, the, the heavier use of injections for routine health care and for getting energy shots and, and, and uh, uh, provides a background for continuing exposure. To that. The blood transfusions, there's been a conscious effort to try to tamp down the use of blood transfusions because you can't reliably count on a testing system uh, in any poor country. There are too many forces against it. When you get a transfusion in, in, in Cameroon, it was your responsibility as the patient to identify a donor. It was often a family member. You'd have to buy the equipment yourself. You'd have to pay for the HIV test, even though it was mandated. The government really didn't supervise it very much. You had to pay for the test yourself. You might not want to pay the $4 for the test, $5 for the test. You might pay for it, and the person you paid might steal the money and do some other bogus procedure. You know, there's corruption shot through this. A good friend who runs a blood bank in India said to me she thinks that half of the uh, blood bank uh, uh, donations in India are not actually screened. Uh, so uh, you, know, you have, have 50,000 of those blood banks around the country. Uh, so um, the, let me see. Uh, I just want to give you one incredible factoid in this, that the transfusion side of it, if you remember that the 
the, the belief that we know that from, from the 59 example of, of the human virus that the epidemic exists by 1959 in Central Africa. So if the epidemic starts in this period, what are the number of transfusions that we, we, we counted the reports and made the best estimates of the level of transfusions? And so if the epidemic starts in the 50s, uh, by the time we reach the 80s, uh, when we're doing, when the data are available, uh, it looks like 20 million transfusions were done in sub-Saharan Africa, areas that now have prevalence rates in double digits, uh, that 20 million of those transfusions were done uh, in those 40 year, in that 40 year period. And probably another 20 million have been done since. Uh, so this is a massive exposure. Uh, once the epidemic, so the point is the epidemic's up and running by here, and all these transfusions are happening with no, oh, the, the, the point to the 80s is that's when the test becomes available. The test becomes available at 84, 85. So there was no possibility of testing the blood in this period, and there was nothing you could see about the person who was infected necessarily to tell you that they were. Um, and let me stop with that. Okay? Listen time. Thank you.